Yeah. When I started collecting watches, it was all about the watches, and that's all I kind of ever expected it to be about. Just silly little man jewelry. And for the most part, it's still about that. But I think with every strange hobby, there are communities that form around them. And meeting people who also know the name of Tudor's bracelet adjustment system or the reference number of a discontinued Quartz Grand Seiko, it's been pretty great. And it's also been great to meet those people's watches. And so I took my camera to a meetup in my hometown to share with you what showed up. Let's start by exploring <clears throat> two watches side by side. On the left is my Rolex Explorer 2 16570 from 2008. On the right is an Explorer 2 1655 from about 1974. Despite the 34 year difference, these were kind of sort of the first and second designs of the Explorer 2. And they look dramatically different, but both charming in their own ways. I prefer the hands of the older watch and I prefer the dial color of the new watch. Another common comparison to the original Explorer 2 is the new Tudor Black Bay Pro. I guess the bezel is really the only direct pull from the first Explorer 2, but it seems obvious and intentional to me. The GMT hand too, kinda, sorta. One frequent and whiny complaint about the Black Bay Pro is the thickness. And yeah, at 15 millimeters thick, it, it's noticeable and it absolutely should be thinner. It's just a GMT, but it's very wearable and I think overall a pretty handsome watch. Now let's move down in price, but not down in charm. This is the Halios Fairwind, designed in Vancouver, Canada, and kind of the successor to the wildly popular Seaforth. The Fairwind actually comes on a pretty cool bracelet, but the owner of this watch has it on a NATO strap. And it looks like this NATO might be from Ute Watch Company, I forgot to ask, give me a break, I got a lot going on. This Omega Aquaterra gives me feelings and has for years. This is the Bond Skyfall Aquaterra in 38.5 millimeters. Years ago, I went back and forth between the 38 and the 41 millimeter versions of this watch. I could never make a decision, so I didn't buy either. But you can see that this size certainly works on my seven inch wrist. And that dial, man, shoot, and that framed day window, which Omega removed in later versions. What a looker. Underrated. And maybe even more underrated in my arrogant opinion is the Cartier Roadster. Cartier doesn't make this strange collection anymore, and maybe you can see why. It's odd. But that also means it's interesting, especially this reference with what collectors call the Vegas dial. The Roadster was the first Cartier to use a quick change strap system, which later made its way into the current Santos watches, but we don't talk about the current Santos watch here anymore, okay? Check out this new Dorenzo DRZ4. 40 millimeters across, 100 meters of water resistance, and only about $750. The steel of this watch is hardened to more than three times the hardness of normal 316L. It's pretty scratch resistant, and that is very appealing to someone with my kind of emotional weakness. It's not easy to develop a new and appealing design language in watches, but I think Dorenzo has done a good job. This looks good, and it doesn't look like anything else. Ah uh, yeah, the Grand Seiko SBGM241. This is, or was, a special edition Grand Seiko GMT, and it was only sold at watches of Switzerland stores. I used to have the regular production version of this watch with a cream dial. Such an elegant and cool GMT. This special edition listed for $5,200, which was $600 more than the regular production SBGM221. Even at $5,200, it kind of feels like a deal, or as much as a luxury mechanical watch can be a deal, which, you know, let's not go down that rabbit hole. That would only make us all very sad. Here's one that's been on my list to make a video about. This is the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore Diver in Forged Carbon. This reference came out in 2012 and wasn't produced very long, so they've become pretty collectible. I briefly owned a steel offshore diver, and so I get the appeal of this carbon diver. It's so much lighter. The weight was the main complaint about the steel watch I had. Well, the weight and then it comes with a $20,000 price tag. Now let's end how we started, by comparing two explorers, but this time, two explorer ones. On the left, an Explorer 1016 from 1969, and on the right, my 114270 from 2004. At the meetup, we spent some time talking about how the older Explorer looks bigger, despite the fact that these two have the same exact diameter. 
The difference is all due to the bezel size. The older watch has a thinner bezel and so a larger dial and so it looks larger overall. And maybe the smaller numerals and smaller markers play a part in that. And I'm all about those older numerals. I still love them and prefer them and I will fight you about it. But let's not fight. Let's get together and talk about watches and share germs. Hopefully you can find your own community wherever you are. Even someone like me who's intensely introverted, I really enjoy being with other nerds IRL. It's fun and rewarding. I've heard from a lot of people who want to go to watch meetups but feel like they don't have anything expensive or interesting to bring. But you, you are the thing that's the most interesting. If you're into watches, even if you don't have any to show off, you have something to offer simply by being strange enough to enjoy silly little jewelry. Mm-hmm.